The Les Paul was always the dream guitar. I was really, really happy that we managed to develop a guitar that I would want to buy and use. Hello everyone and welcome. This is Graham coming in hot from Toronto. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce former Trailer Park Boys cast member, semi-professional golfer, rock and roll hall of famer and as many fans will contest in Rock and Roll Magazine, one of the greatest guitar players in the world, Alex Lifeson. Hey Alex, how you doing? Good Graham, thank you for that wonderful introduction and you got it in the right order. <laughs> Whew. Thank goodness, so happy to have you here today and uh, Alex is here to celebrate the release of his new signature guitar, the Epiphone Les Paul Access Standard. Uh, and uh, as we're talking about that new guitar today, we uh, asked Long McQuaid uh, staff members across the country uh, questions to contribute to our conversation today. And if it's okay with you, Alex, I would like to start off with Tyler from Guelph. Tyler from Guelph asks, what is it about Les Pauls that makes it a favorite of yours? Uh, you know, the Les Paul was always the dream guitar. Uh, I think growing up, seeing so many players that I admire play a Les Paul, uh, you know, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, um, Pete Townsend, all of those, all of those guys that I emulated and looked up to, they all played Les Pauls and they sounded so great. They had that very distinctive, warm, but thick sustain and, uh, and it looked so great. And as a player, it has a nice balance and weight to it. So you always feel like the guitar is well situated on your body and you're just uh, playing the neck rather than holding the neck. So for all those reasons. Just a perfect fit sounds like. Yeah. So um, your signature Les Paul, what, what was the creative process like when you were uh, building it with, uh, with Gibson? So we started that uh, around 2009, I believe. It was released in 2011, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, when we talked about doing my own model, it would have been easy to just stick my name on another guitar and call it that signature model. And, uh, but if I was gonna get involved, I really wanted to have a guitar that was very um, connected to me and what my, requirements were as a player. So I sort of made a note of all the things that I wanted on, on that guitar, the, the piezo, the, um, the Floyd Rose, uh, the coil splitters. Um, you know, once we got through all of that stuff and the pickups, uh, we went through a few different pickup changes until we found the right set of pickups for that, that body. Um, I was really, really happy that we managed to develop a guitar that I would want to buy and use, uh, certainly on tour. Um, and it was quite satisfying for all of us to see the kind of response that that guitar got uh, early on. Well, it's a beautiful guitar. And now you mentioned the Floyd Rose in it. Uh, uh, Brian from Mississauga and Connor from Winnipeg, they're wondering uh, why you picked a Floyd Rose as opposed to like a two point bridge or other types of tremolo systems that are available. Well, from my experience, the Floyd Rose, the Floyd Rose was always the most efficient uh, system to use. Um, you can argue, and certainly it's a good argument, that it's a real pain in the neck to lock down the nut. But really, once you lock down the nut, it's done, and then you can fine tune on on the bridge itself. Uh, and it's a very effective vibrato arm. I've used other vibrato vibrato. Uh, systems in the past and none of, none of them even came close to what the Floyd Ro uh, Rose does and did for me uh, particularly when I first started getting into using it. Um, so with the creation of this guitar is there like any small detail or a little easter egg uh, some uh, Alex Lifeson signature that people may not be aware of? Oh that's a good question I, I don't really think so you know because it's it's a second generation from the Gibson model. We would sort of covered all those areas and, and it has all the things that I wanted to, to have in that guitar. I mean, when they first sent it to me, after we talked about what we were gonna do with this model, um, I was really impressed with that first prototype they sent because it, out of the case, it felt great. It sounded great. And, you know, I spent a couple of weeks on it, really trying to play it 
as much as I could and get a feel for it as much as I could before I would give approval to it. Um, I was really, really quite pleased with the work that they'd done and how they'd recreated the guitar in a more affordable platform for particularly for younger, you know, new guitar players, uh, you know, beginners. It's it's a great way to start. But also at the same time, you know, even seasoned players, this is a great instrument to have. It has a great utility and, and uh, variety uh, and it's it, it could be a welcome uh, addition to any uh, guitar stable. That's that's awesome, and uh, yeah, I I really love how uh, how you you're bringing forward this uh, this beautiful model, and making it affordable, making it accessible for for everyone kind of to to take it and play. Um, now it has a lot of features, has a lot of pickups. Uh, one of the most interesting features, as you mentioned, is the piezo pickup. Uh, now Lindsay from the Nymo, she's wondering. What are some of your favorite ways to make use of that uh, that ghost piezo behind the saddles? Yeah, great question. I, you know, with if in Rush, I used acoustic guitars a lot on all our material. Uh, sometimes very very subtly, sometimes more obviously. Um, when we wanted to play a song like Camera Eye from Moving Pictures, there's a lot of acoustic guitar in it. The, the, the verses have acoustic in it. Uh, there's acoustic in the background with the support of the electrics. And, and I thought, what, how can I do this? You know, I, I used to have a, an acoustic on a stand and I would play it and then switch to the electric when it was one or the other. But I really wanted to a, a, a find a way that I could blend it in without using sort of an artificial uh, clean sound to emulate what the, the acoustic is. So the great thing with this guitar is it's got two jacks. Uh, a one is for the piezo and you can go straight out into a separate amplifier or interface. And that's what I would do on, on tour. I had you know different units that I could use to recreate uh, any kind of acoustic sound, a Gibson or Martin or whatever. Um, and it was a nice clean sound and then when that was blended in with a song like Camera Eye for example it gave the impression of truly two guitar players playing at the same time you know the density of the of the humbuckers and the clarity of the of the piezo was such a great combination I'm, I remember getting so many comments about oh my god was somebody under the stage playing uh, at the same time like how were you doing that and this is a, a great solution to that, that problem uh, and very, very effective. You can blend it in on the guitar or you can go through the separate jacks as well. So with this Les Paul Axis, what, what's your favorite song to play on it and why? <laughs> well, I tell you with the vibrato arm and the, those humbuckers and how warm they are, certainly Limelight is a, is a great candidate for that guitar. Nice. So Justin from Toronto uh, says that uh, Rush's music has so many iconic solos, moments that are ingrained in people's minds. Uh, when playing the songs live, do you strive to recreate those moments as accurately as possible? Or do you try to find room to improvise and try something different? I think traditionally uh, we always try to recreate what our albums were. So certainly in the earlier days, uh, what you heard on a record was what you're going to hear live, except that it's amplified and it's it's live. And um, as things progressed, you know, we we became more complicated in our arrangements and our music. But we've always tried to recreate what we did on a record uh, live. Now, a lot of players or a lot of bands like to be quite um, loose in in their arrangements. Um, and certainly we love to improvise, but for Rush, you know, we decide, okay, this is where we're going to improvise for two minutes or three minutes in the middle of this song. And then the next time we played that song, it would be that same thing. <laughs> so it was improvised for the first time, but that's, that was the nature of the way we worked. We were very anal about being pretty accurate in, in whatever we did. Uh, we loosened up, you know, in, in the later years, but... Um, I think it was always more important to try to recreate something that people had been listening to and were used to. And certainly with solos, uh, that's very much the case. If you, if you play a song pretty you know, faithfully 
And then you come to the solo, which can be a high point of the song, and it's not really related to the actual solo you've been listening to a million times. It's very, very uh, disappointing, I think. So I always try to be as close as I could to the solos that I originally did. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You know, approach it with a methodical approach and kind of give the fans what they want to hear. Um, yeah. yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, so you've been, you've been playing for, for quite a while and you've toured everywhere. Um, so within Canada, did you have a, a favorite place to play and uh, why? Why would it be your favorite place? Well, certainly playing in Toronto was always uh, a, a, a treat uh, at, at the actual gig. <laughs> Everything else was crazy. Um, you know, hometown, uh, all your friends want to come. You know, there's so many demands and you're just trying to be focused on doing the gig. But uh, the Toronto audience for us was always r really, really supportive and really terrific. Montreal is another great city to play in. A crazy, wild, loud audience. Um, uh, on the East Coast, you know, actually across the country, I don't know if I, I have a favorite. I guess hometown is always a favorite for, for most things, for most people. But, uh, you know, we were lucky, I think, because we were a Canadian band that did well on the international stage because we were, you know, we're a pretty small country. And anybody that kind of moves out of this country and does something with any kind of notoriety uh, is sort of a hero, I think. So we've been fortunate in that our audience, Rush fans, have been so into the band and so a part of the growth of the band. It was pretty good all across the country, no matter where we played. Well, that's amazing. Um, so Justin from Toronto is wondering, are you the type of player who's inspired by the type of guitar you play, or do you find yourself playing kind of the same way uh, regardless? Um, no, I think, I think guitars, and especially if you have numerous models and brands, um, it, it, you, can, uh, you can consider it your toolbox. And, you know, the hammer does a different job than a screwdriver. Um, I'm still learning what that is, but uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can use different guitars, f different pickups different for different applications. And I find that some of my guitars just to have such a different feel when they're sitting in my lap and I'm playing, you know. Um, uh, that's the thing I like, I, I've always loved about the Gibsons, especially the Les Paul, it has this weight and this presence. The 355, my, my absolute favorite beloved guitar that I've, um, you know, had since 1976 when I got it brand new from, from the factory, uh, has such a weight to it that it just sits on my body and, and I put my hand up and I play it. I don't hold it up. Um, and the action, the tonality of the pickups. Hey, yeah, you know, a lot of it, I think, it, you, players are distinctive in the way they handle a guitar. I think you could give a different amp to five players, like the same amp for five players, and it'll always sound like them, even though they're different and... Uh, it's it's all in the hands in that in that case, and the guitar is a translator of of what your hands are doing. So Larry from Fredericton asks, did your use of the movable shapes up and down the guitar neck come from your love and study of Pete Townsend, or what influence did the Who have in your playing? Yeah, I think uh, the Who had enormous influence on uh, on us uh, and Pete Townsend specifically on me. Um, if I was to, if I was to uh, select a handful of the great guitar players that influenced me when I was a kid growing up, he was certainly in that, you know, close to the top of that list. I, I think I learned so much about playing acoustic guitar from the way he did. Those chords, yes, that was definitely uh, an influence and I think I'd sort of developed that more because of the way Rush worked. The, Rush was a very active rhythm section. Getty and Neil were very active players and a lot of times the guitar had to hold the fort down um, which was a sort of an opposite reaction to what normally happens. Usually it's the guitar that leads everybody else. Uh, so that required me to m create more um, tonality and more uh, harmony, more sound to create this, this 
bigger sort of foundation for them to move around as they would. So playing those open chords and open strings ringing out and, and all of that was all part of that uh, desire to, to create that, that foundation. And a lot of it did come from Pete, I think more so than, than any of those other, you know, than Hendrix or Clapton or, or Page did at the time. Three piece as well, right? You know, there was just a great bass player, a very active bass player, a very active drummer as well, much like we were. So we've got a few more questions for you before we, uh, before we wrap it up, Alex. And to take you uh, on a little bit of a, a sideways note, uh, I mentioned in your intro, uh, you're in the Trailer Park Boys. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> you appeared in uh, several episodes of the Trailer Park Boys. You've been on film and television. Tell me a little bit about uh, what it was like to work in the, with the cast and crew of, uh, of the show. Well, th they're great guys to start with. They're wonderful, wonderful human beings. They're, they're really, really sweet people, generous of spirit. Um, when I first worked with them, uh, you know, we had some friends, common friends that suggested that I get in touch with them about actually, you know, doing an episode and they were, uh, really excited about, you know, I suggested just a cameo and they said, no, 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 let's do a whole episode revolving around you. And, uh, and we did that uh, closer to the heart episode. And we became fast friends, and I've done you know a few movies with them. I've done a few other episodes uh, with them. We stay in touch. Uh, they're just really, really a lot of fun. I think they're super, super creative and very, very funny, and really smart about the way they've developed this whole uh, Trailer Park Boys brand. It's 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 brilliant, actually. Well, Alex, I've I've seen the episodes. I've watched it. You were excellent. It's <laughs> really. Really, really funny. Um, I think it speaks here to your great sense of humor as well. Um, and uh, you know, just just before we, we wrap up here, I just want to say uh, thank you so so much for for uh, coming here today and uh, and answering questions with us. Uh, really excited about your new Les Paul. Um, for those of uh, for those people watching that that don't know, uh, Alex has a couple singles out on his website that you can check out: uh, Cable Blues and uh, Spy House. So please check it out. And. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Alex. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I have a long history with Long and McQuaid and Yorkville, dating back to 1969. So it's uh, even earlier than that when I used to go to the store and sit on an amp and, and play guitars for a while until I get kicked out. But uh, it's nice to know that this relationship has lasted, you know, 50 years. It's pretty amazing. So it's my pleasure. Hey, everyone. This is Graham from Long McQuaid in Toronto. We just got the Alex Lifeson Les Paul Signature Access Standard. Uh, comes in this beautiful semi-hard shell uh, Epiphone case, Epiphone stitching. Of course, nice pocket to keep all your stuff. Let's open it up and have a look. Oh, wow. Look at that. Comes in this beautiful triple A flame maple top in Viceroy Brown. Doesn't get much better than that. So on this Les Paul Access, it's got a bunch of beautiful features and appointments, including the cream-colored Keystone tuners, locking nut, it's got Alex Lifeson's own signature contour on the back of the neck here. Uh, it features a ceramic pickup in the, uh, in the neck position and a Pro Bucker 3 in the bridge. We got ourselves, of course, the Floyd Rose bridge, where, so you can do all your crazy dives. And it's got push-pulls on each of these pickups, as well as a piezo pickup and separate input. So you can do a piezo uh, sound as well as an electric sound at the same time. So here we are looking at the back of the guitar. On the neck, we have the Alex Lifeson signature neck shape. Near the bottom, we have the contour uh, on the heel. This allows for easier access past the 12th fret. You've got belly cut right here. That gives it more comfortability. Battery cavity for the piezo pickups. And then if we switch it to the side here, you'll see that there's two input jacks. Now, each of these input jacks has its own job. One is a piezo input, and the other is the regular input. So you can run them both simultaneously for that extra oomph. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We had such a great time having a conversation with Alex about his new guitar. This is the Epiphone Alex Lifeson Les Paul Access Standard. Come down to the store, ask us about it. We'll get it in your hands and playing in no time.